Hi everyone, welcome to Astronomy 236. This is the second and final lecture bite for week five. And today we'll be talking about dark matter and dark energy. Again, this week we also had two topics that seem to go pretty well together as opposed to three separate lecture bites. So we have two lecture bites that are both slightly on the longer side. So I'm gonna talk about dark matter and dark energy separately. These are mysterious parts of our universe that we don't really understand. So I'm gonna show you why we think they're there and what we think they might be and talk about where we might go in the future to try to figure out what these are and figure out what actually most of our universe is made of, even though we can't see it. So to start talking about dark matter, I first want to ask a different question, which is what does it mean to be in orbit? So for example, what is the difference between the moon, which is held to the earth by gravity that stays in orbit, and an apple that is held to the earth by gravity, but which falls from something like a tree or someone's hand and doesn't stay in orbit, it just crashes into the earth and stops there. What is the difference between these two scenarios? And why does the moon stay up and the apple stay down? And the answer is that the moon doesn't fall to Earth because it's going fast enough sideways to always miss. So what do I mean by this? So suppose I have a guy who's standing on Earth and he has an apple and he just drops it. The apple will fall to the ground. But what if instead of dropping the apple, this guy starts throwing it forwards. And if he throws it a little bit forwards, then it might go in a curved path uh, because when you fall, things go in curved paths, but it'll still hit the earth just a little bit further away from him. All right, let's try this again. Just throw it a little bit harder. Now we're starting to get this apple going even further. And we can keep doing this, throwing the apple harder and harder until it starts landing further and further away from us. And eventually we start throwing the apple hard enough that it makes it a significant fraction of the way around the curvature of the Earth. So what if instead we throw the apple so hard that it never makes it to the Earth and it always just curves around it because of gravity instead of hitting the Earth. It's going so fast that no matter how hard gravity pulls it, it just pulls it in a path that keeps it from hitting, it keeps it from missing. This is an orbit. So really the only difference between the moon and an apple is how hard it's being thrown and how fast it's moving sideways. The, move ha the moon has a lot of velocity pointing perpendicular to the Earth's gravity. So the moon keeps going around in circles because it's got enough velocity to miss the Earth as it falls. So this is a tricky concept, but it's very important for understanding uh, the idea of dark matter and how, we under, and how we know that it's there. So I'm gonna show you a clip from a History Channel show which describes the same idea. And hopefully after this, you'll be able to understand a little bit better uh, why things are in orbit and what it means for it to be in orbit. All right. So now that we've seen this clip, I want to ask a related question, which is, we know that if you throw your apple fast enough sideways, or if you shoot your cannonball fast enough sideways, the apple slash cannonball will stay in orbit instead of falling to the earth. But how fast exactly does that need to be? And I want to show this to you in two different ways. So the first one is this formula, which is this velocity, the, the speed that you have to be going. And it's a velocity because it has to be going in the right direction. If you're going straight towards the Earth, you will crash. But if you're going perpendicular towards the Earth, you'll stay in orbit. So the velocity that you need to be going at is determined by three things. One of them is the universal strength of gravity. This is a number that is true in all of the universe. It tells us how strong gravity is as a force. So that's always constant. It depends on how big the thing is that you're orbiting. So you need to shoot yourself 
faster if you're orbiting a massive object like the sun or like Jupiter. And you don't have to shoot yourself as fast if you're orbiting something that's lower mass like the Earth or the moon. And it depends on how far apart you are. So the closer you are to the center, the faster you have to go. And the way that we can show this is with this graph here. So on the y-axis of the graph, I'm showing the orbital speed of the planets in our solar system. So how fast these planets are moving sideways, how fast they're going in their orbits so that they don't hit the sun. And on the x-axis, I'm showing how far these planets are away from the sun. And we think that the sun is most of the mass in our solar system. In fact, we know it to be true. We're very, very confident in that. And what you'll see is that when this is the case, this curve, this uh, rotation curve, if you will, showing how fast you have to be going to stay in orbit decreases. So very close to the sun, you have to be going very fast. But further away, you don't have to be going as far. And that's because gravity is less strong the farther you are away from the object that you're orbiting. The sun's gravity is weaker out of the orbit of Pluto than it is at the orbit of Mercury or Earth. So Pluto doesn't have to go as fast to stay in orbit. So I'll say that again. The more massive the object is that's being orbited, the faster another object has to travel in orbit not to crash into it. And if you know that, you can turn it around. And you can say, if you know how fast something's orbiting, you know how massive it must be the object that is orbiting, because you know how fast it has to be going to avoid crashing. If we see it in orbit, and we see that it's orbiting something, and we know how far it is away, we can turn that into a measurement of how massive the thing it orbits is. And this is how dark matter was discovered. It was a series of observations, many of which used this exact same principle. So this is not the first observation, but it's a famous one. And it was done by an astronomer named Fritz Zwicky uh, in 1936. And what he did is he looked at a cluster of galaxies. So this is a bunch of galaxies that are all orbiting around each other, orbiting around a common uh, center of mass. So these galaxies are kind of in a swarm. Think back to the simulations that we saw in the previous lecture by forming these galaxy clusters. You could see all of those little galaxies flying around each other and flying around the dense regions of gas in the center. So what Fritz Zwicky did is he measured the speed of each of those galaxies towards or away from us using the Doppler effect. And he said, well, on average, these galaxies should be orbiting kind of all randomly and they should be going in all different directions. So if I assume that that's true, how massive must this cluster be? And he got an answer. And it was very, very massive. Well, of course, that makes sense, right? Galaxies are huge. They have billions of stars. And if you're in a cluster, there's many, many times more stars than uh, their galaxies than there are in just a single galaxy. So there should be a lot of mass. But then Fritz did something else, which was he calculated how bright the galaxies are and therefore how many stars they must have. And what he found is that if you added up how much mass you think must be there from stars that's producing light, and compared it to how much mass there must be from his gravity calculations based on how fast the galaxies are moving around, there's more mass needed to keep those galaxies held together in orbit than he actually saw from the light. So what he concluded is that the light matter, the stuff that produces light, is not enough to explain his observations. And that there has to be dark matter in addition to that that's helping to hold this galaxy cluster together. This was uh, a little bit controversial at the time. It was a little bit ahead of its time. But in the 1970s, the observations became basically undeniable. And one of the leading people in making these observations was Vera Rubin. And what she did was a very similar idea. But instead of looking at a cluster of galaxies, she looked at one galaxy at a time. So here's a graph that shows her observations. So on the x-axis, you can see that we're showing the distance from the center of a galaxy in light years. 
And you can see over this image, there's actually a galaxy there where the origin of the coordinates is at the center of the galaxy. So you can think about this as showing where each of the stars are in that galaxy. And that position in the galaxy is that position on the uh, x-axis as well. So at the location where it says 10,000 light years from the center, that part of the picture is actually 10,000 light years from the center of that galaxy. So what Vera Rubin did is she measured how fast stars seem to be moving around the center of the galaxy, again, using Doppler shifts. And what she found is that they were moving a lot faster than they should be. So think about it this way. Instead of the case in the solar system where we have all of the mass in the center and we have a sun which contains most of the mass and we get a rotation curve that starts up high and then comes down lower, Vera found that the further away from the center of the galaxy you go, the faster things are rotating. And the only way for that to be true is if there's a lot of mass that is distributed all around. But here's the weird thing. If you extend those observations out even further beyond where there is any more stars, so you can see that there are very few stars further than about 20,000 light years away from the center of that galaxy, it still increases. So gas that's out there still is orbiting faster and faster than it was closer in. That is weird. It means that there is matter out there that is not producing light, but which is producing enough gravity to cause all of the stuff in orbit to be going very fast. And also plotted on this graph is what you would expect just from the stars. So you get this lower curve here, this dashed curve, that's lower always than the curve that Vera and uh, others observed. And that instead of getting higher as you go further away from the center of the galaxy, it's lower. So this is a strong indication that there might be some dark matter, matter that doesn't show up as starlight further out, causing the galaxy to spin faster than we think it should based on just the stars alone. And here's the idea, is that perhaps in a galaxy, you have a central region where there's a lot of stars and where there's a lot of gas, but it's surrounded by this dense, uh, invisible halo of dark matter. And this halo extends far out, so further out than you can see with the stars. And that's what causes this dark matter, uh, this, this, this stronger, faster rotation than you uh, expect just based on what the stars look like alone. So when these observations all came in, there were a couple of different possibilities. So what could be causing this, in general, faster than expected motion? And one possibility is what I just said, there's extra mass. And our best guess is that this extra mass is some fundamental particle that's like a proton or a neutron. So it's just like a particle of nature, but it's a particle that doesn't happen to interact often with light. So it's very hard for us to see. And that extra mass is there and it's causing gravity, but we just can't see it with our telescopes. So we don't know that it's there. The other possibility is that something is wrong with our understanding of gravity. And Newton's ideas and general relativity need to be modified to make sure that we can actually describe how gravity works on very, very large scales. So this might sound outlandish, but it's actually not that crazy because we don't really have good tests of Newton's and Einstein's gravitational laws at huge distances. We can't, for example, in a lab, measure the strength of gravity across the entire distance of a galaxy. There's just no way. So we have to rely on the only observations we have out there to tell us if our theories of gravity work. And what we find is that they don't. They don't match what we actually observe. So is that because there's extra mass, which is what many people believe? Or is it because something is wrong with our understanding of gravity? So this is actually an ongoing debate. Now, most people come down on the side of it being caused by dark matter and that Einstein and Newton's gravity is actually pretty good. And the reason, one of the strongest reasons for this is because when you're trying to figure out how structures form, how galaxies form from the early universe, 
dark matter is really important to making sure that those galaxies form fast enough. If there was no dark matter, we might not have any galaxies to live in today based on how long the universe is formed. So this is one of the strongest arguments in favor of dark matter, but there are certainly people who believe otherwise. And I'll have you read one of the articles uh, for this week's reading written by one of these people. So this is a brief overview of dark matter. What we know, what we don't know. So I wanted to close by saying, where do we go from here? How do we start to understand dark matter better? And there's a couple of promising avenues. So the first one is to continue trying to find dark matter, not in space, not in astronomical observations, but when it actually comes to us. So the idea is that we think if dark matter are these fundamental particles, of nature that are like protons and neutrons, but they don't interact with light. They might be passing through us or near our solar system all the time, and we just never see them because they never touch us and they never interact with us. So there are experiments on Earth that are trying to catch these dark matter particles as they pass by, like cosmic rays. Um, and there are a bunch of them, and none of them have found anything yet. But as we build more and more sensitive experiments, we should be able to either find one of these particles and show that dark matter does seem to exist and we can actually detect it with particle detectors in our labs. Or we'll find that no, there doesn't seem to be anything there and our theory needs to be changed. So this is a really promising avenue and hopefully in the next decade or so, we should be able to say something pretty firm about at least some flavors of dark matter. And I'll give you another reading to learn about what some of the candidates are, what are some of the particles that might be uh, dark matter and might be uh, this additional mass that's causing these unusual observations that we see. And the second avenue, which is a little bit complementary, is to try to look for any hint of light from dark matter. We don't know that dark matter doesn't produce light. All we know is that it must not produce it very much in the same way that protons and neutrons and electrons do. So it's possible that if we look carefully and if we look at places where we think that there's a lot of dark matter, such as, for example, the center of our galaxy, we might actually see some hint of it. And there have in fact been claimed detections where people have looked at the center of our galaxy and thought that they saw a little bit of extra light that might be coming from dark matter. Now these are controversial. There's a lot of things in the center of our galaxy that can produce light that looks like that. Uh, but it's possible that we will eventually see the signature of dark matter in astronomical observations kind of in the wild, the way we normally would expect to learn things from astronomy. All right, so I'm gonna switch gears now and start talking about dark energy. Dark matter is pretty mysterious, but it, compared to dark energy, we really understand it quite well and have a pretty good handle on it. Dark energy is extremely mysterious and we're very early on in trying to figure out what it is and what it even means about our universe. So to think about dark energy, I want you to ask yourself, what happens when you throw a ball upwards? So I'm showing this guy here, he's throwing a ball and he's catching it again. And what you'll notice is that the ball speed changes as he throws it upwards. When he throws it up immediately, it's going very fast upwards, but then it slows down and eventually briefly pauses at the very top of its uh, trajectory. And it has no velocity at that time. And then the velocity becomes negative. So as you, as you throw something upwards, its speed decreases as it gets higher. So let's apply this same concept to the entire universe. What happens when you expand a universe? As you go out, things will eventually slow down in principle. And in fact, they could even come crashing back down to the way it was at the beginning. If you throw the ball upwards, it'll come back down. If you throw a universe upwards, it might come back down as well. This idea is called the big crunch. But it doesn't always have to be this way. So instead of throwing a ball upwards, what happens if you throw something really fast, like you throw a rocket upwards? This is the rocket launched by SpaceX when they were doing their test of their new rocket system. 
and this launched a car into space, which was then shot out of Earth's orbit and into orbit around the sun. That car is not going to fall back down to Earth. That car is going to be stuck outside in space and will never come back down as part of its trajectory. So if you throw something upwards fast enough, it might just go up and keep going. It'll slow down, sure. Uh, in fact, it will slow down forever if it's uh, you know, not accelerating like this rocket is right now. But it will eventually never come back and it'll never fall back down to Earth because it's gone far enough and it's gone fast enough and it's expended enough energy to get out of Earth's gravity for good. And the same thing can happen with the universe as well. Even if the universe is slowing down because gravity is pulling everything back together, it could just keep going forever. So this is what scientists were thinking about in the early 1990s. And the question they wanted to know was how much is the universe's expansion slowing down? Is it slowing down enough that the universe will eventually come back everything will collapse in on itself and we'll have a big crunch at the end? Or is it slowing down just barely and it's going fast enough now that the universe will keep expanding forever? And in that case, it'll just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think the term is the big freeze is what they would call it. It'll eventually just get colder and colder forever and ever and ever. And the universe will be infinitely, uh, keep, keep expanding forever. So the way to figure that out is to take Hubble's diagram and extend it much, much further back in time. Because right now, when you look at Hubble's diagram, you can see how fast the universe is expanding very close to us. But if we look far enough back in time, we can see what the expansion rate was a long time ago and see if it, how much that rate has changed, how much the universe is slowing down as it gets bigger and bigger. So to do this, we need to switch tools. Hubble's law was originally done using Cepheid variable stars, which we've talked about several times in this course now as a standard candle. We measure how their period is, you can figure out how bright they are intrinsically, and therefore how far away that Cepheid variable must be and how far away that entire galaxy must be. But Cepheid variables are not very bright themselves, so we can't locate them across vast parts of the universe. For that, we need to use something brighter, another standard candle, in particular, a supernova. So this is what two research teams did starting in the 1990s. They started looking for these supernova, and they started trying to use those standard candles to measure the expansion of the universe very, very far away from Earth. And what they found was shocking. It was paradigm changing because they were looking to see how quickly the universe's expansion was slowing down. And it's a little bit hard to convince yourself of this in these diagrams, but what they found is that all of the points at high velocity, I'm going to uh, get out of here and use my cursor to point. So all of these points up here at high velocity seem to fall above this line, this constant line, for a constant uh, velocity of expansion. And the same thing from this other team. This is a team led out of Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. This is a team led out of uh, Berkeley and Harvard. So both teams independently found that, this, uh, excel, uh, that the universe was not constantly changing. That's what they expected. But what they found is that it was actually accelerating it was expanding faster and faster over time instead of slowing down. That is crazy. The universe is doing something that is totally contradictory to everything we experience. If I threw an apple upwards, I would not expect it to accelerate upwards and go faster and faster the further it went. But that's exactly what the universe appears to be doing. So how could this be? Um, and it comes back to Einstein's general relativity field equations. And you'll remember that I mentioned this cosmological constant term. This was a term that was added in by Einstein to see if he could make the universe balance and keep it perfectly in tune so that its density wouldn't change over time. 
It turns out that if you use that cosmological constant, but you change its value, it can act like an anti-gravity force that pushes space apart. It causes everything to expand away and causes everything to keep expanding like a balloon. And that's what it appears our universe is behaving like. So this anti-gravity force, this cosmological constant, is what we call dark energy. And we really don't have a good handle as to what could possibly be causing it. So our current strategy is really one of reconnaissance. How can we try to understand something so strange, something that's so different from everything else we know about in physics? And the strategy that we've chosen as a field is we just have to keep learning more and more about it. We have to map out with increasing precision and increasing care exactly how the universe is accelerating. So let's push our supernova to even greater distances and let's measure even more of them so we can find just exactly how fast the universe is accelerating and if there's any patterns in that acceleration over time. And what we're hoping for is that we'll see something that doesn't quite match everything else we know about cosmology, everything else we know about the behavior of the universe over time. Because if we see a deviation from the current cosmology that we have, the current physics that we use to describe our universe, then that might tell us where to look and where to start putting our attention to see if we can figure out what could fix that and therefore get some ideas as to what the actual cause of dark energy might be. So this is a little bit of an unsatisfying scenario, right? We've been trying for decades now. This was discovered in the late 1990s. So for 20 years now, we've been trying to figure out what could this dark energy be. And all we can do is just try to look for something, anything for us to grab onto and start thinking about. But over the last couple of years, we may have started to find the first hint. And this is very much preliminary. This is something that most people, I think, still are very skeptical about and are not convinced at all that this is something that could be pointing to the answer. But it's our best hope for now. And it's something called the Hubble constant tension. So the Hubble constant is basically just the slope of the line in Hubble's diagram. So I'll flip back to that. So how fast does this line rise? How much, uh, how much further do you have to get away to get a certain change in velocity of expansion? So essentially, how fast is the universe accelerating? And since Hubble's time, we've learned a lot about this. And we've learned a lot of different ways to measure this. And two of the different ways now seem to be giving slightly different answers. So the y-axis is showing our measurement of Hubble's constant and the colors are showing two different methods. So the blue methods are using a approach where we start at our current position and we try to look back in time. So we look at things in our nearby universe. We look at Cepheid variable stars, we look at supernova, and we try to measure very precisely uh, how fast galaxies are moving away from us, just exactly the same way Hubble did. But this red, uh, these red points use a different method. Instead of using observations of our nearby universe and trying to look backwards, they use observations of the early universe and try to project forwards. So in particular, they use the cosmic microwave background radiation. And they say, assuming the cosmic microwave background is the way we believe it to be and the way we see it, and assuming that all of our models, all of our physics that we use to describe the early universe is correct, what should Hubble's constant be today? And very intriguingly, over only the last couple of years, we've started to see a disagreement. And this disagreement has only grown stronger over time. So now we find that the distance ladder, the nearby universe approach, thinks that the universe should be expanding, thinks that the universe is expanding away from us faster than it should be based on the cosmic microwave background and our measurements of the early universe. 
So this could just be some mistake in our observations. If you've learned anything over this course, it's how much dust can affect your measurements. It could be that we just haven't quite figured out the dust and we have a slight disagreement because of that or an, any of a number of other astronomical problems. But people have tried over the last five years or so to figure out if there's anything wrong with these calculations. And so far, they all seem to be holding just right. So it seems possible that this tension, this disagreement between what we see in our current universe and what the physics predict we should see could point us towards the solution to dark energy by figuring out something that's wrong with our understanding of physics, pointing us to where to fix it, and then that could give us an insight. So I just wanted to finally end with a conclusion, uh, which is that when you add up all of the matter and energy in our universe, the vast majority of it is dark. All of the dark energy we don't understand, but it makes up the vast majority of all of the energy and matter in our universe. And dark matter overwhelmingly outnumbers the amount of matter that we see in stars or in gas or in atoms. So our universe is a very mysterious place. Even after all we've learned in the last several hundred years, especially all we've learned in the last century. In the last century, we've gone from not knowing that galaxies were outside of our own galaxy to having this amazing knowledge of the history and the origin of our universe. But we still have so much to learn. There's still a ton that we don't know, and it's an exciting time to be an astronomer.